Hi, I'm Scott with BibleStudying.net, and we've been talking about the history of the church, the early church. We've been talking about how the early church was a, was a the apostolic church was a house church system, and they, they had a full communion meal, and their teaching sessions were partly interactive. Um, and so we then began to look at the 4th century church and how this changed. Uh, they stopped meeting in their churches, their, home, their houses, I should say, and they began re- meeting in, in basilicas, which were Roman imperial buildings and pagan temple buildings. And instead of having interactive teaching, uh, they began to use the, the art of Greek rhetoric modeled from the Greek orators and sophists, who were these paid professional speakers uh, who would come and, and give these great orations, these artful speeches to the audiences in the basilicas. And so we, we started with a quote from Wikipedia on what rhetoric is this ancient Greek art. Um, and so the next quote here is from Wikipedia again. It says, Sophists, they, organi- they were organized throughout, uh, organized thought about public speaking began in ancient Greece. Uh, in, ancient Greece in ancient Greece, Sophists were nevertheless popular and well-paid professionals, widely respected for their abilities. Uh, the Greek word Sophist comes from... Uh, the word sophist comes from a Greek term, which uh, means a wise man, uh, and it, in fact, it refers to a class of Greek teachers of rhetoric, philosophy, and the art of successful living. So when you think about a great speech, uh, an oration, uh, you might think of a pastor that you've heard, and maybe that pastor speaks in that way, uh, and, and maybe they teach on how to live a successful American Christian life, and they get this from uh, these guys here, and this is from, that quote was from Merriam Webster's online dictionary. Uh, and so the, the great um, speeches of these the speeches of these Greek orators uh, were called homilies, and you may recognize that term. It's another term for sermon, and there's a reason for this connection. As early as the, this is a quote from uh, from a church historian today, it says as early as the third century, Christians called their sermons homilies. The same term the same term Greek orators used for their discourses. Today, one, this is another quote, today, from, uh, today one can take a seminary course called homiletics, seminary courses where pastors are trained for the, given their professional training. Uh, you can take a seminary course called homiletics to learn how to preach. Homiletics is considered a science applying the rules of rhetoric, that's this Greek art of speaking, uh, which go back to Greece and Rome. The next quote from the Catholic Encyclopedia says, homiletics. It's the science that treats the composition and delivery of the sermon or other religious discourse. The Standard Dictionary defines homiletics as a branch of rhetoric that treats the composition and delivery of sermons or homilies. And the next quote is from Wikipedia. It says homiletics from homilos. That's the Greek word there that these orators were using. Uh, it, it's a related word, I should say. Uh, in theology, the application of general principles of rhetoric to the specific department of public, te- uh, public preaching uh, and then it goes on to talk about this is just another word for uh, preaching and for the sermon or the homily. And so today we have pastors. Uh, they are paid professionals. They are trained and paid in uh, trained in the art of Greek rhetoric, and they're delivering these uh, usually very moving orations uh, on how to be a successful American Christian or whatever it would be. And uh, they're using homilies or sermons, and they're all developed from and taken from the uh, the tradition of the ancient Greek sophists and orators who were also paid professionals and did the same thing. And in fact, today's pastor and the ancient Greek rhetor, uh, orator or, or sophists, they're all speaking in uh, of similarly designed buildings based on the same structure going back to Roman imperial uh, and pagan buildings, pagan temples. And so um, even the special seating that we have in, in terms of the pastor in the church today up on the platform uh, comes from this, this same tradition. We already saw that the basilicas had a special special place for the magistrates. This was later taken uh, and used for the bishops, and so um, the, this was actually called the cathedra, the special chair. Um, it says, uh, the traditional position, this is from Wikipedia, the traditional position of the cathedra um, had been the position of the magistrate in the Roman Basilica, which provided the model and type for, and sometimes even the actual structures for early Christian basilicas. And then uh, from Encyclopedia Britannica says the cathedral was used in early Christian basilica as a raised bishop's throne. And so when we think about this, uh, a special seat for the orators in the Greek Roman imperialists uh, is obviously a part of pagan culture, 
It's now become a part of our, our Christian church structure and the way we do church every week. But what does the New Testament have to say about this idea of oration and great speaking and the art of rhetoric and, and special seating? And it seems to contradict some of the statements that are made. And let me give you an example. Uh, in the New Testament, Paul and, and some of the other uh, apostles and teachers made it very clear that it was their intent not to speak with artful words or, or man's wisdom, but to speak plainly and humbly and deliver the teaching of Jesus, of Jesus Christ to the church. And let me read some passages from Romans 12.8. Uh, Paul says, He that exhorts, uh, let him do so with simplicity. 1 Corinthians 12.2.1, uh, he says, And brethren, when I came to you, I came not with excellency of words or of speech or of wisdom, uh, as I declared to you the testimony of God. In verse 4 he says, My speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom. Uh, in 2 Corinthians 1.12 he says, For our rejoicing is this, the testimony of our conscience, that in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, uh, as the sophists or orators were doing, uh, 2 Corinthians 3 says, We use great plainness, plainness of speech. 2 Corinthians 10, he says, uh, um, we skip to 2 Corinthians 11, Paul goes on to talk about how, contrary to his methods, uh, there were false teachers that he was that were going out in the church, and he's warning the church here, and he says, I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ, and then he goes on to talk about how these people would go on, uh, these false teachers would preach. And then he said, but though I'm rude in speech, again referring to how his speech was plain in comparison to these, these other men who were speaking. Uh, 2 Peter 2.18 says, when these men, again of the false teachers, when they speak great swelling words of vanity. And in Jude 1.16, again of the false teacher says, uh, their mouth speaks great swelling words. And so this is representative or referential, at least to the tradition of the Greeks, in their speaking in public and uh, religious services. Uh, and and uh, similarly, uh, Matthew 23.6, Mark 12.38, uh, Luke 11.43, Luke 20.46, and all, all are passages where Jesus is saying, uh, where he's condemning the idea that the Pharisees had special seats for, them, for themselves in the synagogues. So, uh, and then in James, James says, uh, he says, with respect to persons, of giving particular respect to particular people, he says, for if there comes into your assembly a man with a gold ring, you have respect to him, uh, and you say to him, sit here in this special or this good place. And then, and then he says in verse 9, if you have respect under persons, you commit sin. So it seems like these ideas that the pagans were doing in the imperial courts and in their, in their orators and the basilicas were not what Jesus and the apostles practiced or had in mind. And yet we've incorporated them somehow. Additionally, uh, the idea of a paid professional is, seems, is outside of the New Testament practice. For example, uh, the Jewish rabbis at the time, their tradition was to to have their own occupation and to work with their hands. Uh, Paul, for example, is according to uh, Acts 23.6 and 26.5 and Philippians 3.5, Paul was a, uh, he, he says, I was trained as a Pharisee, as a Pharisee of rabbi. But we know that he continued to uh, practice his own uh, craft of tent making, even after he had been converted and was sent out by Christ to preach the gospel. Acts 18.3 uh, talks about this. So the, the rule established in the churches seems to fa follow this Jewish practice. And I'm going to pause there so that we have enough time to cover it, and we'll cover it in our next section, that uh, even the idea of being a paid professional uh, pastor, or paid professional speaker, I should say, or teacher, is contrary to the New Testament tradition that was handed on by the apostles. So we'll look at that in just a second.